Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Steve Lewis, and I'm a Senior Director of RISTEC based in the UK. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, and welcome to this RISTEC webinar. Uh, this webinar is the first uh, in the six series that we've run since May last year. Uh, we regularly ask you what topics you'd like us to cover, and as, as a result, uh, we will be presenting on four of the most popular requests. Uh, the first of those topics is the subject of today's webinar, uh, which is about integrating human factors engineering into CAPEX projects. Hopefully, we can provide some useful and practical insights for you. Uh, the webinar is going to take about an hour, so that's around 45 minutes for the presentation and about 15 minutes for Q&A. A quick spot of housekeeping, uh, we have muted everybody, so the sound won't be distorted by any background noise. If you'd like to ask questions, and we do encourage you to ask questions, uh, then please use the Q&A function. You're probably familiar with it on Zoom, but you just pull your cursor down uh, to the bottom of the screen. There's the Q&A tab uh, in the middle of the, uh, the bar down the bottom. Just type in your, uh, uh, type in your question there. Um, keep it simple, please don't use the chat. In fact, we might have disabled the chat anyway. What we'll do is I'll keep track of the questions and we'll aim to cover as many of them as we can at the end of the session and certainly within the hour that we have available. Okay, I'd now like to briefly introduce RISTEC uh, to those of you who don't already know us. Apologies to our regular participants who've already heard this many times before. I'll be pretty quick. Uh, so at RISTEC, we help clients to manage health, safety, security, environmental and business risk, uh, especially in sectors where the impact of loss is high. Uh, we do that through five uh, different service areas, consulting, so specialist risk management services, uh, online and classroom training and postgraduate education. Uh, we also provide associates who are able to work at client sites. We also uh, undertake industrial and vendor inspections and assessments as part of uh, asset integrity management. Uh, and then we also conduct research and development in the field of risk and safety management. I'd now like to introduce our speaker today, uh, Derek Porter. Uh, Derek is a principal human factors consultant based in our Warrington office. He's a chartered ergonomist and human factors specialist uh, with over 30 years of consultancy experience across a number of different safety critical sectors. He's managed major projects with a number of clients such as Shell, Petrovac, uh, Technicash Reunidas, uh, uh, COSL, Drilling, Gasco, the Energy Institute, the HSE, EDF Energy, Babcock Marine, Network Rail, and many more uh, as well. Derek's areas of expertise include human factors integration and human factors engineering support to major projects, uh, as well as safety critical task analysis, human reliability assessment, and competence management system. Okay, Derek, over to you. Uh, thanks, Steve, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so what we're going to talk about today is, is the process for ensuring that you can successfully integrate human factors in, in your CapEx project. So if, you, if you're developing, uh, uh, building a new facility, doing, doing major works, or even doing sort of minor modifications to existing plant, how do, you, how do you go about making sure you consider human factors? So the presentation I'm, I'm going to give is based around the IOGP uh, 454 report, Human Factors Engineering and Projects. That's, that's a guidance that's been produced by the UK Energy Institute and the International Association of Oil and Gas Producers. And RISTEC, uh, we did the work for the Energy Institute and the IOGP to produce that guidance, and I was a, a main author of that. And what that guidance does is, is we canvass lessons from industry, we talk to industry stakeholders in different companies, and we talk to um, human factors professionals uh, and, and those in the, the Energy Institute's Human Factors Group. And, and what we've done is compiled best practice industry guidance and a recommended approach for the integration of human factors engineering in uh, it's fain, fain my focus on the oil and gas projects, but that guidance is equally applicable to all sort of major design projects. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. That guidance is about just shy of 100 pages, but I'm, I've got about 28 slides. So we'll go through some of the key points. So the first, first question to ask ourselves is, you know, what is this, uh, what is human factors? Um, and human factors can be simply thought of as 
when you're looking at the design aspects of it, you're not looking at the hardware aspects of design, you're looking at how the, the people in that process, you know, which role do the operators play uh, in, in the design? How, how do you design to take those into, into account? So you're applying the understanding of human capabilities and limitations to make sure that you design optimal equipment, systems, tasks, and processes. And what you're really doing by considering human factors is you're making sure that you think about the person and you design the task and the system to, to, fit, to fit what they what they can do and what their requirements are, how they work it. And um, the Charles Institute of Economics and Human Factors puts this sort of rather well in this, rather than expecting people to adapt to a design that forces them to work in an uncomfortable, stressful, dangerous way, Ergonomics, ergonomists and human factors specialists seek to understand how a product workplace or system could be designed to suit the people who need to use it. So it's all about designing to the person. Um, and human factors engineering specifically is how you incorporate that process uh, within the design of projects. And I'm going to use the term HFE from now on rather than have to say human factors engineering throughout. Uh, so we're going to talk about how you how you think about HFE in your projects. So, you know, why should I consider human factors? Well, here's some examples here of what can happen if you don't consider it. Uh, and on the left there, we have this, this huge jumble of, of valves, you know, and imagine someone trying to go and uh, uh, valves and gauges, imagine someone going to try and take a reading off one of those gauges, the chance that they're actually going to get the wrong gauge or get the wrong valve is, you know, is, is pretty high. And some of these other photographs equally show, you know, the difficulties of ac accessing things for maintenance uh, or for operations. So you have this chap sort of reaching through some, some pipe work that's in the way to operate that panel. Over on the uh, on on the left on the right hand side down the bottom you have the uh, the wheel valve that how do you turn that wheel valve when it's very very close to the to the sort of uh, the pipework there, so all, these are all aspects of design. Well, obviously there's there's been no real thought about human factors, um, and you know you get to the fact that you've you've designed this this plant and you're going to have to sort of take remedial measures once it's in place and there's probably little you can do about it. So. That's a good reason for considering human factors. And there's an increasingly uh, regulatory requirement to make sure you do integrate HFE within projects. Um, and across the world, various countries have set expectations for integration of HFE within the project design life, life cycle. So it's included in this sort of company legislation, uh, country legislation, I should say. And similarly, uh, technical requirements for considering HFE are also an international, national, and industry standards, as well as the larger companies will have company specific standards and specifications. So a lot of the major oil companies will have their own internal standards that require you, that mandate you to, to do this process. So if you're gonna be doing a, 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 a CapEx project, most likely you are gonna have a requirement to, to look at HFE. And you can break those, um, those requirements down as well into prescriptive goal orientated and process. So prescriptive requirement may mean that there are certain standards that you need to follow. So there may be certain dimensions, for instance, of ladders that you need to say, well, we have to make sure that when we when we when we use ladders or, or when we position walkways, we've got an adequate dimension and a clearance there based on a, on a standard. There may be goal orientated requirements that say, well, you've got to demonstrate that you've reduced the risk of human error to as low as reasonably practicable. And the way you do that is making sure that you consider the, the HFE in the process. And within these mandated processes, uh, there may be a requirement to do specific HFE activities such as valve criticality analysis and 3D model reviews. And this slide shows just some of the benefits that you that you would gain from ensuring that you consider HFE uh, in your projects and you do it early. Uh, you have these, uh, as I said, uh, reduced chance of sort of errors, uh, improved productivity. You're making the task easier to do, uh, so you should you should have a more effective task, uh, greater job satisfaction for for uh, the workforce, uh, less less turnover, and you know. Uh, reducing the uh, the potential for any sort of safety impact. And the, the graph on the right just shows the fact that if you think about considering HFE early in the design, you know, you need to factor that into your process, but uh, 
overall, that's going to be a lot cheaper for you to do it early and make sure you address those things early in the design. If you don't address them and you go through to operations and then you find the issues, the cost of actually addressing those at that time is, is a lot higher. And there's probably not much you could do about the design then. So you're probably working at looking at what can we do about training and procedures to try and mitigate any errors. So you really want to try and look at your HFE as early as you can. So you have a project, you are, you are developing um, uh, modifications to existing plant or equipment, or you may be designing and building a whole new facility. What are the key questions um, that you have? I think one question, the obvious question is, do I need to think about HFE at all? Uh, and if so, you know, what level of detail uh, do I need to go into? You know, uh, Will I need specialist human factors input, ergonomists and human factor specialists, or will it be things that we can do internally within, within the company? How should we plan uh, for effective integration of HFE in the project? And what types of HFE activities uh, you know, may we need to do? What, what are the typical things we need to do? Often people say to me, well, I'm not, what is this H, uh, human factors? I don't understand, you know, what is it we need to do? So what, what sort of activities? And, and most importantly, I think, what can be done then uh, when you're planning this to ensure that if you are looking at HFE, how do you ensure it, it's successful? And so these are all questions that I, I just want us to address uh, in, in, this, in this webinar. And the key, uh, issue really is to at the beginning is to really make sure you consider HFE way at the beginning of the project in the planning stage so if you if you can consider stuff at the beginning in the planning stage then you're setting yourself up to make sure that you're going to be considering HFE throughout the design life cycle and you're going to improve the effectiveness of it and so HFE planning could fall into these three areas that I'll go into uh, in a little bit more detail. So the first is that up front, you're going to have to carry out some sort of screening activity to work out uh, which HFE uh, activities you need to do, if you need to do any, and what that looks like in terms of the level of input you may need and the sort of activities and inputs that you may need to do. You'll need to define what sort of roles are you going to need on the project? You know, who's going to need to be in place and, and what are their responsibilities going to be? And then from that, you'll need to develop a strategy and a clear strategy and a plan uh, that will help you understand, you know, what are the activities you're going to do and how you're going to determine um, that you're meeting the requirements that you've set. And I should say, actually, that stuff I'm going to show you here is from this IOGP 454 report. And the purpose of that report is that it's intended for non-HF professionals. So not people like me, but people may, that may not quite know as much about HFE. And the idea is that it gives you enough of an understanding, hopefully, that you can gain an idea of what you need to do and you know when to bring, bring somebody else in to sort of provide that sort of detail. So it gives you lots and lots of tools that you can use to help you sort of work out what do I need to do? What does that look like? And how much input do I need? And then I can bring in the specialist if I need to. So the first part of the screening um, is a preliminary HF screening. So if you've got a complex project, what we suggest is that upfront as early as you can in that project, when you're at the selection phase or the concept design phase, where you've got an idea of what's being required, you carry out a preliminary screening exercise. So the idea of this exercise is just to ask yourself, do we need any HFE input? And if we do, you know, what's the sort of level? Let's get a broad based idea of what we may need to do. So what IOGP 454 does is it has this, uh, these lookup tables. And this particular one here gives you a set of questions. This is just a partial uh, selection of those questions. But you can see there that what it does is it asks you to think about the project or the change that you're doing to site and asks you to think what's involved in that. So, for instance, there's a question there. Will the new project... Um, involve changes to the layout of the plant or the facility that could impact on the accessibility and operability of equipment. Well, obviously, it's, if you say yes, then obviously they're going to need to have some input there because you are going to be impacting then on, on the ability of operators to, to actually operate equipment. So that's going to be a clear one that you say, yeah, okay. And then that would identify you need some HFE input. Uh, and so the way you use this screening is, you go through these questions, uh, you, you can say uh, yes, yes or no to help you understand. Um, if you've got no yes um, answers, then it's unlikely that you'll need any HFE input. 
but to be honest, for most projects, you'll need some, some level of input. Perhaps the only example where you wouldn't do was used in very minor modifications, and it, it would be, you know, like for like equipment that you've already assessed and approved before with no changes. That might be the only example. In, in all other cases, the answer is probably going to be yes. And, uh, and that tells you that you're going to have to have this input into the project. Uh, and a greater number of those yes responses gives you that sort of high level broad brush indication of how much input you may need. So if you've got, you know, a whole raft of yeses there, you're going to be thinking to yourself, OK, we, we probably need quite a lot of input here. Um, and the other thing that comes out of the screening is looking at these, these, these activities, uh, these uh, areas of change in the project. It can help you identify some of the key HF related risks that you might need to be thinking about. So you do that at an early stage. A bit later in the project, so you've, you've said to yourself, we do, need, we do need the HFE input. A bit later in the project, when you have the project scope confirmed and you know a bit more about the design details, then you, we suggest you would carry out a more detailed screening. Uh, and so for doing this, you need to involve the, uh, some, some people that have uh, a suitably detailed knowledge of the design that you're proposing to do and the changes that you're making. Uh, and also a knowledge of, of how you're going to operate or maintain the equipment or the plant as well. So you want to think about what does that mean in terms of are, are there going to be changes to operation uh, and, and the way that we do things. And at this point as well, you, you also want to involve someone who's got a, a suitable level of HF um, human factors competence. And that's to make sure that because this is the process where you're going to be identifying the activities you need to do. So you probably need someone with a bit of expertise to help you firm up exactly what's required. And once again, IOGP 454 uh, gives uh, some, some useful lookup tables to support your decision making. So we'll, we'll go through those. But effectively, what you're doing at this stage is you're identifying the particular activities you may need. Um, you're thinking about the level of input that you may need. And do you need a particular uh, a specific uh, human factors plan? And then all this information feeds into you developing a human factors uh, strategy. So one of the first lookup tables uh, in the uh, IOGP 454 is one which helps you identify the types of inputs and activities that may be needed, and that's based on the nature of the of the design that you're proposing or the change. Um, and so you can use that to sort of look up, and then what the document does is is give you some guidance on what are considered to be the key HFE activities that typically take place that I'll talk about in a little bit. And so for each of those activities, it tells you a bit about what that activity is and when you would use it, what's involved in, in doing that, what level of specialist input you may require and where you get further information. So that all helps you to understand and, and develop an idea of the types of activities that you need. Uh, but a final decision on what you would do, you typically require some specialist input to, to help, help finalize that. And so this lookup table, this is a, a extract from the lookup table, which helps you think about the level of specialist input you need. And, and I, when I say specialist input, I mean someone that's, uh, you know, an agonist or human factors specialist that's, uh, that's, that's qualified in that. So what you'll see here is we have a number of statements and I'm not going to read them all out, but you can see that each statement, again, you look at the statement and it gives you an indicative level of input that you may need and an indicative strategy. So if we look at the first box at the top, pick out the, the text in blue, uh, the statement is any prescriptive HFE requirements are likely to be covered by existing human factors, ergonomic standards or guidance. So if that's the case, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, particularly new and the guidance would tell you what you need to do, then your indicative strategy, if you look on the right, may be that all you need to do is check and confirm compliance, compliance with specific standards and maybe seek specialist advice if you need to, uh, should there be any sort of non-compliance issues. So you can actually work out what you need to do about that and the sort of trade-offs. So your level of input for that sort of project, a specialist input may be low. It may only be you need to bring someone in only if you have an issue that you spot. As you go down that table, you'll see, you'll see a higher level of input. Um, so if you get to the, 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 uh, the row at the bottom and we look on the left, we see that, uh, if you have specific HFE studies that you need to do, or if you have implications for performance of safety critical tasks, where you've got the potential for a major accident, a major process safety 
accident if you don't get it right, then that, that's likely to be a, a project where you need a higher level of HFE involvement. So we've got a high, high level there. And what you need to do there is, is have your HS specialist involved in the design reviews, but also you probably need to appoint someone specifically to manage the HFE input to that project. So you'd have a HFE manager and you need to have specialist input then into that uh, demonstration that the risks associated with safety critical tasks are mitigated. So these, these sort of lookups are not meant to be definitive and exhaustive because they can't be really, but it's to sort of give, um, give people an idea of, give you an idea of a feeling of, of, of where you need to be. And, and so it gives you a good starting point to actually put together your strategy and then bring in a, maybe a human factors person just to confirm it. And let's have a look up there and ask us, do we need uh, a specific human factors plan to be written? Um, and so if our level of input is low and we are saying that what we're effectively doing is applying standards, and we're not doing any specific studies, uh, we're just going to apply the standards. If we have an issue, we may seek some advice on it. Then potentially you're not going to need a separate human factors plan. It might be that your strategy for looking at HFE could be documented in the project safety plan or, or a similar document. But if we have a higher level of input, then it's probably recommended that you would have a, a specific uh, human factors plan. Uh, at a very high level, you'd, you'd have a standalone plan with quite a lot of detail in it. And what the IGP 454 does as well is give you like a template of the typical contents for what a HF uh, a plan looks like. So we've, we've talked about an idea, we've gained an idea of what activities we may need to do. We've gained an idea of the level of uh, HFE involvement we need. And then we have to work out for the project, what are the roles and responsibilities that we need? And again, it's all linked to what we've already defined. So if we've got a, a low level of uh, input that, that we believe we need, then our HFE roles, we might say they are, uh, you would call them a HFE support role, just applying the ergonomic standards only. That might be a, um, a role that could be carried out by someone within, within a, a design organization that doesn't have any particular uh, human factors uh, expertise. But as we get into the, the higher levels of, uh, of input that we need, then you'll need someone with, with that human factors background. So you'd have human factors practitioners who would, who would take undertake design reviews and activities and you'd have a human factors integration manager who would coordinate and manage the work so what um, the iogp 454 has in it is a suggested competence framework for these uh, types of roles and what that does is, is give give an idea of what the required competences would be for these roles uh, and what the minimum requirements would be for training and for the number of years experience you would have. And again, it can't be like a definitive, but it's, it's, it's been discussed with, you know, with the human factors professionals in industry, and it's believed to be a reasonable um, sort of framework that you, you can use to sort of look at, the, look at the inputs that you need. And that helps you define you know, for those roles what their responsibilities will be on a project. So we, we, have, we have all that information now from the screening that, we, that we've done, the detailed screening. Uh, and that means we can develop our strategy. Uh, and, if, and if we've decided we need a plan, uh, as opposed to just a, you know, a short strategy statement, then develop our... And so um, our plan, what does our plan have in it? Well, it would have our roles and responsibilities that we've just talked about, that we, we would have defined, and we, we would explain exactly where they sit into the organisation and how they actually interact with, with the other managers within the design team. And the key thing is really is the human factors role should be an integral part of that design team. So, so they, sh they, should be, they should be built into the project organisation. We'll identify any particular standards or human factors or ergonomic standards or, or guidance that, that we need to follow uh, on the project. And we'll define our approach in this plan for end user involvement. So what that means is a key point of uh, a key aspect of human factors really is a user centered design process. And, and what that means is that if we're designing a new plant or we're changing equipment, the end user of that equipment is going to be an operator or a maintainer or, or a manager 
or someone that's going to be using it. So you want to get their involvement in the design of that equipment or that plant or that system uh, to, to make sure that it, it meets their requirements um, and to sort of fine tune that design. So this sort of process of making sure you have end user involvement is thinking about how you're going to do that. Are you going to set up a working group of people? Uh, you need a process in which you're going to get end users or representatives into design reviews and user trials. And so you build that into your, into your plan. And similarly, you need to process uh, in place for managing HFE issues. So as you do the design and you review the design, you are likely to come across uh, areas of concern and issues that will need to be raised. And then you'll need to sort of come to a resolution of how you're going to manage those issues. Are you going to need to make design changes? Are you going to, are you going to need to do uh, you know, something else to, to ensure that you, you close them out? So there'll need to be a process for that. And that might be using an existing project uh, risk register if it's a huge, large project, you may have a human factor specific issues register that you would set up. And you would describe the HF activities that you have identified um, that are going to take place and also the acceptance criteria. So what that means is if you're going to carry out like a design review, what, what are you going to do to actually determine that that um, uh, that uh, the, uh, the outcome from that review is acceptable. So you may set a requirement, you may say our acceptance criteria is it has to comply with this standard that we've identified, or it may be that we will do a user trial and if the users are all okay with it, then that, that will show us the acceptance. So that needs to be defined. And lastly, the, the plan will show how the HFE activities will be integrated into the overall project program. So it's quite key that they are built into that program and built into that schedule. Um, so again, it's an integral part of the whole design life cycle and the whole design process and not just an add on uh, at the end. And I think that's the whole thing with the, what this whole, the word integration, human factors integration into projects. That's the key here. Um, in the past, often human factors is not considered early enough um, and, it, and it's considered as a bit of an afterthought. And as I say, um, when you consider it a bit too late, there's, there's very little you can do about it or you can't make the changes. So the key thing is, integrate it into the project at the beginning, uh, you know, build that into the process. So once you've done your plan, um, you can see on this, this is, this is a sort of a typical project design life, life cycle with the life cycle phases uh, at the top. And what we've been talking about now is, is usually it's concept selection, it's early design phase. So all of this planning, screening, develop the strategy, produce the plan, assign the role, set up the mechanisms. That all happens early on. From then on, uh, what you're going to have is you're going to have the, the human factors people and the, and the HFE activities taking place throughout the design. And so what that typically means is as the design progresses, uh, people are going to be taking part in design reviews and they're going to be iterative design reviews. And as the design progresses in more detail, they're going to get more, more detailed reviews. So it'll be design reviews, uh, design validation activities, input to hazard identification, risk management activities. And throughout that process, you're tracking and managing the closeout of, of uh, HFE issues. And so when you get to the, uh, the commissioning, you'll, you'll have a, a closeout and you'll better demonstrate that you've covered all the HFE issues that you've raised and you've, and you've addressed the requirements that you've set. So I've been talking a lot about activities and HFE inputs and, uh, and that sort of stuff. So what, what do I mean by that? There's a lot of different things, but here's some of the sort of common inputs and activities that, you, that typically we would be involved in uh, in, a, in a CAPEX project. And one might be that in addition to talking about specific ergonomic standards and human factor standards, it might be a need to actually produce a project specific uh, HFE design specification. And the reason for that would be, it, it will be a one-stop shop then for the design engineer. So you could focus it particularly on aspects of the, of the design that they need to focus on. So you don't have to go and look at you know, multiple uh, multiple standards from the shelf. So you might have one uh, set of design specifications and they can use that then as they're developing the design uh, as, as a sort of go-to to sort of see what, what they need to be doing. 
Similarly, um, uh, for particular things like you see here, this, this skid package uh, uh, for an offshore um, facility, uh, this sort of equipment here, a task requirements analysis we may carry out on that sort of, on that sort of package. And what, will that, what that would be would be to have a look at that, understand the tasks that have to be carried out uh, on that piece of equipment and actually identify, are there any specific additional uh, HFE design requirements that we need to set then. So you might sort of say, well, actually, I think we need to give more space in this area so we can actually access this valve. So it usually pull, it might pull out some more requirements that may not have been pulled out early in the project. And as I, as I mentioned, I think that one of the other things would be input to a lot reviews and hazard identification and risk management activities. So things like HAZOPs, HAZIDs and bow ties. Um, there's always an element in those of uh, looking at the potential for human failures. And so uh, bringing in a HFE specialist uh, is going to be a recommended to ensure the risks associated with human failures are properly considered and addressed. Uh, and so as well as taking part into these, 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 these processes that involve all of the different design disciplines, uh, there may be as, as well additional activities that are led by the HFE specialist, such as safety critical task analysis. So that's a that's a more focused uh, risk analysis that's specific to look at um, the human factors. And um, we have another webinar that covers that uh, specifically that you, you can have a look at. So uh, the, the most common input really for this type of project would be uh, input to uh, design reviews and validations of, of the design as it progressive, progresses. So that's an iterative process throughout the design life, start, life cycle. Um, and HFE specialists would work closely with the designers and the end users of the equipment. Uh, and in these design reviews, uh, the issue will be to identify potential issues or any non-compliances against the specified requirements and help advise on solutions uh, and, and trade-offs. Uh, and, and this is the key thing, really. So, so then what you can demonstrate is that you've had your specialist input um, and where you have found an area where uh, maybe it's a, a little tricky to to absolutely meet the requirement of the, um, the standards uh, for, for like a, say like a clearance dimension on, on a walkway, um, you know, you're going to be able to sort of look at that and say, well, can we, is that going to be acceptable if we can do a few other little tweaks or do we actually could need to redesign the whole plant? So that's a sort of iterative discussion process with, with the design engineers. And these engineers typically uh, involve desktop reviews of drawings uh, and, and 3D model design reviews as well. So 30%, 60%, 90% design reviews, uh, a HFE person be a, being a part of that design review team in those meetings uh, to identify the issues. And typical areas for um, HF input would include looking at the plant layout, um, so that's looking at accessibility to gauges uh, on vessels, uh, looking at accessibility um, to, um, to, to buttons and, and controls, looking at sort of escape, escape routes, access and egress paths, all those sorts of things. Um, reviews of equipment and skid packages, uh, as I showed in that last slide. So you might look at a particular package of equipment. Uh, the screening aspect is some of these, uh, if you've got a, a, a package of equipment, which is an off the shelf one, it may be that there's not too much human factors in, input required, but if it's a bespoke piece of equipment, then it's likely that you're gonna to need to carry out a bit more focused review. Um, and so one of the key ones, uh, key activities as well is valve criticality analysis. And that's really looking at um, the uh, accessibility and visibility of, uh, of valves by, by categorize, categorizing valves in terms of their criticality on how often they need to be operated or maintained um, and if, if they've got a, a, a safety critical role in, in isolation. And then from that, there's, there's guidance which would, would say to you, for this type of valve, this is where you need to locate them. So that analysis would be a thorough look at checking that valves can, can be accessed according to those requirements. And a, a major area for human factors input are, are control room studies. So whenever there's um, uh, changes to a control room or, or the development of a new control room, that, that's an area you can guarantee you're going to need to have some, some HF input because you are, by the very nature of that, you are controlling systems. There's a safety and monitoring role uh, and you need to look at the 
uh, the arrangement of uh, the workstations um, and the arrangement of people within the room to make sure they can communicate with each other and maintain situational awareness. And the last one on there is a human machine interface and alarm system reviews. So again, if, if you are making changes or you're introducing a new HMI, then that's, that's an area where there's a lot of requirement for uh, HFE input uh, because uh, to ensure the usability uh, of those systems in line with uh, sort of known human limitations uh, around, uh, you know, uh, uh, memory and uh, accessibility. So that's all the stuff. So um, the process, but what can be, um, what should we do to make sure that's successful? So I've broken this into sort of three slides. Um, and, and the first is the planning stage. So we talked about that screening is absolutely essential. So carry out the screening at an early stage and revisit it if necessary. Define the HFE requirements upfront along with the evidence required to meet those requirements. So that'd be the acceptance criteria. So that's what we need to do, how we're going to, uh, satisfy ourselves that we've met that. What do we need to do to show that? And mandate the need to apply HFE throughout the design process and set requirements for HFE review and sign off as part of the project stage gate process. So, so build it in that, you know, that's going to be a key requirement to actually move through the project. There's going to be HFE requirements that need to be met. Clearly document the HFE strategy and produce a detailed plan uh, when required and build those HFE activities and milestones into the project design schedule. And ensure a robust process is set up for tracking and resolution of HFE issues that I mentioned before. So potentially, you know, use of some sort of issues register, either part of the project register or set up a separate register for, uh, for human factors. Resourcing and commitment, um, assign HFE roles uh, as part of the integrated project design team. And we talked about those sort of roles that you may have and provide them with an appropriate level of authority, um, you, you know, so they can actually, um, you know, make recommendations and they have some sort of, some sort of uh, weight on the project team to, 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 for those to be listened to. Ensure there's competent HF resource and arrange for specialist HF input at an early stage where required. So as I said, for, unless it's a very small project, there's usually going to be a need for some sort of specialist resource. Um, and if you can get that in early stages, you can, you can, you can work out, you know, exactly uh, the activities where, where you actually need someone. It may be that there's some activities that can be carried out without a, a HF specialist and others will need one. Obtain project senior management support and approval for the HFE strategy and the plan and assign an appropriate budget. And again, this is, this is again, emphasizing the need to sort of give the HFE the appropriate weight in the project. Oh, pardon me. And set up processes to ensure there's a suitable end user rep representative involvement in the design process. Uh, and as I said, that might be a use of a working group. So if you set up a working group, uh, and you identify operators and maintainers and people that are going to be using the system or, or working in the new plant, uh, you know, find some representatives that are going to be available to the project um, and they can take part in the working groups and then they can be used as a pool to take part in design reviews, user trials and for the HFE specialists to sort of talk to to get their input. And it also means that there's, there's a buy-in there uh, as, as well to the final design because they're going to they're buy into that process. They know they've contributed to, to coming up with that final design to, to suit what they need. And consider appointing a HFE champion to act as the focal point for HFE within the organization. And in terms of actually carrying out the tasks, then when you start to sort of do the activities, a good idea is to provide HFE awareness training to the project design team and discipline engineers at the beginning to facilitate appropriate consideration of HFE throughout the design process. So if you, so if you, we often do this and we, you know, we talk to the design engineers, we give them a bit of a presentation about um, you know, how people make errors, uh, good good ergonomic sort of principles. And that's useful because as they're doing the design, they've got that in the back of their mind and they're thinking about those things. They're thinking not just designing to meet the functional requirements, but also to meet the requirements of the end user, the operator. And so that means they're more likely as well to come up and say, oh, I, I, I think I have an issue here and, and call in for HFE input. Actively manage HFE activities throughout the design lifecycle in line with the plan. 
So actually act on the plan that we've put in place and ensure that HFE design requirements and constraints are considered in the same way and given equal emphasis as any other technical requirements and constraints. Because as I say, I think HF considerations have been a poor relation, but the, the way to make this work is make sure they've given the same, same weight uh, as anything else. And ensure active participation of end user representatives during design reviews in resolving issues and, uh, and carrying out user trials. So just on this, um, this slide, just what I wanted to show was in terms of, I was thinking about the projects that Risk Tech uh, Human Factors has been involved in, uh, just to give you an idea of how it can vary. So here's a couple of projects on here, and you'll see that we did a project which was throughout the detailed design phase for onshore refinery in Kuwait. And that was about a two year project. So we had a HFE, HF manager, because it was a high, you know, on our, on our list, it was a high level of HFE resource. We had a, a dedicated manager and we had a couple of people that were doing the design reviews, HF practitioners. And you'll see there that we, we did quite a lot of activities. We did the screening and the plan, and then we did various things, skip package reviews, HMI reviews, you know, quite a lot of different activities. And similarly, the second one for the, the facility in Russia was another two year job, which was on the feed stage. And again, there was a lesser number of activities there, but still a HF manager and, a, and some practitioners. And the last two at the bottom give you an idea of some of the sort of you know, less, um, less large uh, projects. So, so one day of a, a refurbishment of a loading jetty in the UK, uh, for that one, our input was limited to, uh, to taking part in HAZOPS and, and doing a 3D model design review. So for that one, there wasn't a need to produce a specific HF plan, and there was just one person that could provide that input. And similarly for the one at the bottom, um, it control room does desktop review. So it's a more limited project and one, one person could do that. Um, and so for each, each project will differ and, um, and it, would, it would depend as well whether or not the project is a, say for, for a large say oil and gas company, it may be a mandated process that you have to do these particular activities. So they're all gonna be needed to be done. But for other projects, it may be only certain activities are required. So you can see that it's quite hard to sort of do a definitive guidance that tells you what you're gonna to need to do. It's very much on a project by project basis. But I think the, the guidance that I've been talking about gives you an idea that you can start to gain an idea of, of, of potentially what you need to do. So just to sort of wrap all that up, uh, and hopefully it's it's sort of been useful, but these are the sort of key four bullets, I think, that I'd like you to take away. Uh, and the first is that consider HFE early in the design process, uh, carry out the screening early on to find out what's required. Then make sure there's competent uh, HF resource available uh, and, and make sure they're integrated within the design team. Ensure there's a HF strategy and plan and a program for the activities to be performed and that this is managed throughout the uh, design process. And lastly, ensure that you involve end users, which, which will be the operators or the maintainers, whoever's actually going to use the systems and the equipment that you're designing to ensure that you've got a user centered design process and you obtain buy in uh, to that to that final design. So that's, uh, that's all I would like to say, and I'll, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to receiving your, your questions. So I'll pass you back over to Steve. That's excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Derek. Um, just as, as we're waiting for some of the questions uh, to come in, uh, look, I'm going to be a little bit cheeky and just jump in with a couple myself just to get things going. Um, so, you know, in general, Derek, how well would you say that human factors engineering in recent years has been incorporated into oil and gas uh, capex projects and i guess related to that is perhaps how does that compare in your experience with perhaps some other sectors like the nuclear sector or the uh, the rail sector for example Yeah, uh, thanks, Steve. So um, I, I think increasingly it, it, it has been incorporated more uh, recently, but I think what it would do is it would depend on uh, the, the companies that are involved and usually whether or not, in fact, engineering for oil and gas projects 
is required a lot, usually comes down to or not the companies involved have a have their own integration standards which require specific activities to be undertaken uh, or whether the uh, the regulator requires these activities to be undertaken so i think there's still a little reluctance i would say for for companies to be sort of proactive and just say we need to do this unless they're getting a bit of a, this this is needed to be done by the regulator or because our standard requires us uh, to do it um i think in terms of the other industries um Yes, uh, I think it's equivalent, really. I think I think it's a similar sort of process that's that's being um, developed now. I think the other industry that there's always been a um, that there has been sort of this integration. I, I think with something like uh, the civil nuclear sector, um, there's, there's been a more um, uh, more established culture of having HFE specialists within within the design team that actually are integrated in the project and sit in the project for for a long time. And I don't think that's um, that's just starting to happen now for oil and gas. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a question come in from Martin, which was actually exactly the same as one of my other questions. And it was uh, wondering, can you give us a few oh, yeah. practical examples of the type of improvements uh, that you've seen from some of the projects uh, that have involved HSV input like you've been discussing? Yeah. Uh, I I think really, um, well, there's been some that jumped to mind would be ones where you have, um, say, some plants where you, you've got multiple um, uh, small um, uh, control facilities scattered around the plant that have the uh, have inconsistent interfaces that that so operators move between different different um, different control areas on the plant and the interfaces that are used are, are quite different so so the the hf input there for the modifications would be to ensure that the those interfaces are more in, ensure that they're much more consistent so there's been some stuff there where you know you're, you're looking at that and, and you're making sure that as the, as the the operators move between uh, areas of the plant the, the equipment they use is going to be completely consistent in terms of colors, in terms of the way it functions, etc. Another one would be um, certainly what happens is in terms of accessibility to valves and accessibility to gauges. Um, often we've been involved in, in 3D model reviews uh, and we have found examples of where um, uh, valves are inaccessible or gauges uh, are, are, not, are not visible and then working through that process uh, with the design engineers uh, has come down to like you know being changes made to that design to, to sort of better uh, to, to change that so those things can be accessed it's usually those sorts of things around uh, accessibility and around um, the uh, the interfaces I'd say that, that jump out okay thank you um, again just just whilst we're waiting for some questions in, I'm surprised everybody's so quiet. Normally we have lots and lots of questions and it's a struggle getting through them. Um, so uh, if you do have any questions, please fire them in. Uh, I've got a couple more. Um, and the other one was, uh, yeah, have, have you seen much difference between human factors, engineering, integration into CAPEX projects in the US? I think where prescriptive requirements tend to dominate particularly sort of prescriptive ergonomic requirements um, and perhaps say the, the UK which um, over here with its more sort of goal setting approach I know you did touch on that in one of your earlier slides talking about um, uh, the dis, yeah. uh, talking about how prescription and goal setting can influence the type of HF, HFE work that you do yeah, I would say, unfortunately, I, I haven't had too much experience of that. I, th I think most of the, um, the the stuff that that I've been involved in has been on the sort of UK model. Um, but uh, I have done some work in in the sort of Middle East, which is sort of used the um, the uh, the sort of US approach. Uh, I think with the the US approach, yeah, there, there's I, I'm finding it. Um, uh, uh, it's uh, a, a bit harder to um, uh, a bit more of a reluctance, I think, to actually um, uh, carry out the sort of analyses that you need to do. Which I think what I'm trying to say here, 
um, because it's much more on sort of say, well, this is what the standard says, and, and we'll sort of just we'll just do that. And if we can't do it, then um, you know we can't do it. Whereas, whereas, whereas the approach I'm sort of used to doing, I think, is much more based around one. Let's look at the sort of risks on it, and let's let's do the analyses. So I'm finding there's a bit more reluctance to actually sort of carry out the analyses, and it's a bit more focused on we just have these standards, we're just going to follow them. I'm not sure if I've answered your question there, but I think um, in terms of the US, I don't have that much experience with with those projects. I think you have answered the question there, Derek. Um, that. You know, a lot of work in this area, I think, is probably regulatory driven. And if the, you know, if, if the yeah. if the requirements are quite prescriptive, then people will tend to just meet the prescriptive requirements. Yeah. Whereas perhaps the goal setting approach takes a slightly broader, so, uh, you know, arguably more more open approach, recognizing that there are, you know, there is guidance and standards which which are reasonably prescriptive that you still have to comply with. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question in from uh, Susan. When did the terminology HFE become adopted? Um, also, we've looked at IOGP 454, uh, but is there a, a substantial resource for further information? So when did HFE become adopted? Uh, I'm, not, just, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, it's, it's been around for quite a long time as far as I'm aware. And obviously using the term HFE, there's the term human factors, there's ergonomics, there's there's, there's human factors engineering, and they all sort of cover similar things. I, I think that the HFE terminology, to me, it seems to have come up in the oil and gas sector, particularly that use that terminology, uh, rather than I think a civil nuclear would just, would just use human factors and, and uh, the railways would just use human factors. So it just seems to be a term that's, that's mainly, mainly developed in the oil and gas sector. Um, uh, what was the second, second question? Sorry. Yeah, and then uh, the other one is um, okay. Okay, we've talked about IOGP four five four. You've gone through the process uh, in in that, but oh, you know, uh, are, are there other substantial mm, resources mm. We, we we can go to? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think I think the reason for for developing IOG four five four this this was version two. So there was a version one uh, that was out uh, bef before this, uh, and I think that drew quite a lot on um, some of the the integration standards for one of the oil the, the major oil companies. And the reason for developing this new version was because there is a bit of a lack of information out there, and the information that is there for some of these activities tends to be within these within the companies rather than being elsewhere. So, so IOGP IOGP four five four is a good source in itself. Uh, there are some other um, documents um, as well out there. there, there there's, there's, I'm not going to remember them exactly to hand, but we could certainly provide that information afterwards. There, there is an oil, there is a US, um, quite a comprehensive US document, which covers uh, marine, uh, human factors integration on marine projects. Um, and there's, a, there's another, another one as well for that. And what we did with ViroG 454 is it does reference these in, in, that, in that document as well. So there are other, there are other things out there um, that talk about some of these activities. And another one would be a NORSOC actually, which is, which is Norwegian, standard, but it's got some good stuff in it, which uh, would, apply, would apply elsewhere. So that's got some quite good stuff on, uh, on the specifics as well. Um, and, and I'm talking there about these are documents that have the processes in and tell you about the processes, but obviously there's, there's a lot of HF standards that give you quite a lot of information around, around accessibility and, uh, and um, you know, designing, designing layouts and workplaces. I mean, there's an ISO standard 11064, which is all around about control rooms. So that's the go-to standard, for instance, to look about human factors in control rooms. And it tells you the process to follow and it tells you uh, the, sort of, the sort of guidance, the sort of guidance to follow for that. And equally, there's, there's an ISO standard, which is a huge multiple part standard on uh, human factors, um, uh, human factors uh, interaction uh, HMIs, uh, and that's 9241. So there's a lot of um, good information out in the standards, and then there's some other documents that give you the process. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Susan says thank you. Thanks very much for mentioning the uh, the ISO standards there. Um, question from uh, Craig Is IOGP 454 widely available to take a look at? And I guess I'll, I'll add to that is it is, is it free? Is it expensive? Can we just download it from a website somewhere? 
you can, I think you have to pay. It's on it's on the uh, Energy Institute website, and it may be on the the. Uh, I, I'm assuming it's on the IOGP website, but I haven't looked on that. Um, I think it's free to Energy Institute members, and otherwise, it's uh, you have to pay. But I don't think it's too much to actually down, to download it. But if you go it's, to the Energy Institute and, and, and look at it up, or can we provide any sort of links after this of, of some of the, because we I say, I could probably provide some links to some of these other sources of guidance and, and link to where you can get the uh, IOGP 454 as well. Yeah, I think if people Google it, I think they should be able to find it quite easily. I know I've looked at these things in the past and some are free and some are 30 pounds, 40 pounds. It's that sort of ballpark, isn't it? Ah, uh, free. Okay, yeah. David. David has just confirmed that it's yeah. free on the IOGP site. Excellent. That's good news for everybody. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I've I've just got one, oh. one other question, and then oh. then then we'll wrap up. Um, yeah. You 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 mentioned uh, HFE input into HAZOPS. Um, do you have a view on whether say you say it's mm. a a complex HAZOP for you know for a complex facility? With a significant major accident risk, whether a an HFE specialist should be a core member of a hazard team, or should they be a supplementary member, you know, on call to address specific issues as they arise, or perhaps to pick yeah. up HF um, HF related issues outside of the meeting? Do you have an opinion yeah. on that? Well, I, 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 yeah, I, I think I've found something. You've obviously uh yes um can you hear me all right yeah yeah you... um yes so really you have a hazard one has up two don't you which has up to be in more detail and i think sometimes it has up one a high level yeah has up one uh high level has up le uh, uh, level uh usually i don't think the human factors input is, is always that necessary and you can use human factors by words uh sometimes in that but if you get into the more detail um hazards de depending on what you're looking at then it can be useful to have a, a, a human factor specialist in but i don't think human factor specialist necessarily would need to be a core member i think it is dependent on the project and depending on what you're looking at i do think that from my experience the hazards i think being involved in the hazard hazard education where you're actually looking at the hazards and, and looking at some of the some mitigations is usually more useful than being involved in the hazard, which, which in some hazards that I've been in, which is basically saying, could it, could, it, could it occur? Yeah, there could be a human error, and that's the end of the hazard, which you, you don't necessarily need a human factor person to do. You could have some guide words to help you pull those out. Okay, uh, that, that's, that's great, Derek. I can tell it's getting near the end of the webinar because you were becoming fainter and fainter <laughs> as you were answering that question. Um, so uh, yeah, th thank you for that. <laughs> and, 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 and in fact, there's just a suggestion from Su Susan, maybe we should introduce this as a guide words in hazards, or, or at least ensure it's a covered under other. And I know some, some HAZOPs do include specific uh, HF related yes. guide words within them, rather than actually having somebody, yes, an HF specialist right. sat in the HAZOP every you know, full time. Okay, I, th I think we've lost you, Derek. So, um, yeah, just you... to say actually, in, in IOGP 454, I think in the, in the, uh... oh. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Derek, I, I think we're losing the line with you. So, um, I'll, yeah, so I'll, I'll need to just wrap up now. So, yeah, so thanks very much, um, Derek. Um, what we will do for everybody is make a recording available uh, probably later this week or definitely early next week. Um, when you do leave the webinar, you should automatically receive a survey in your browser. I mean, it literally takes 30 seconds to complete, and we really do appreciate your feedback. It helps to inform the topics um, that we uh, we run in the future. Uh, if you've got any questions arising what you've heard today, or you'd like some information on any of the service, then, then please simply email us directly. I think if Derek advances the slide, if you can hear me, um, there's a couple of email addresses up there or at the start of the presentation, Derek's uh, email was available. I'm sure I'd be happy to uh, receive any direct uh, mails from, from you or just go to our website. And there's a lot of uh, forms literally on every single page of the website where you can just send an inquiry to us. Uh, so thank you, Derek, uh, once again. And thank you everyone for your attention.
We're very grateful you've taken the time out of your busy schedule uh, to listen in today. The next webinar is next Thursday, so not Wednesday, it's next Thursday, which is the 9th of December. Uh, at the same time, which is uh, kickoff at 3 p.m. UK, and that's about LOPA, so Layer of Protection Assessment, and I think in particular the link with HAZOP. So hopefully you can join us for that one too, if you're interested. Uh, in the meantime, please stay safe and stay secure. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you.